Well, this is a very special book to me. This is what we call our, our, our cruise book. I remember all of these guys, they're like brothers to me. When you live in close quarters for months and months at a time, you really get to know people. This picture here, uh, Commander Williams, he was one of the pilots <clears throat> that we lost. Those years went by too fast, and I miss it. Uh, I, I miss being a part of the, the squadron, uh, doing something that I felt was very special and unique, challenging at times, could be dangerous, uh, but I'd do it all over again given the opportunity. From my earliest years, I always felt that I would go in the military. It was always important to me that um, I did something that mattered and, and gave me a sense of purpose. When I was seven years old, my, my dad and my parents took me to a Blue Angels air show in, at Moffett Field in San Jose, California. Boy, that grabbed me. I, I thought, that is it. I'm going to be a Navy pilot. I uh, decided that if I, I wanted to fly airplanes, I wanted to do it in the Navy because uh, I was really interested and passionate about learning to land on an aircraft carrier. Uh, that, that to me felt like the ultimate challenge in aviation. If I could do that, then I really arrived as, as a pilot. The program that I was accepted for was called Aviation Officer Candidate School. Uh, and then that was in Pensacola, Florida, and that was about, about two months long. And I'll never forget my first day there. We were trained by Marine drill instructors, and these guys were pretty tough. And he told us, he said, my job is not to uh, teach you to be an officer necessarily. My job is to get rid of those that don't have what it takes. Uh, and there were 76 of us that started with that class. And at the end of that first summer, we were down to 40. And by the time I finished the last eight weeks, which was after I graduated from college, uh, that group was whittled down to maybe 15. And my, my commissioning class, there was just 10 of us. And the best I could account, there was just five of us that ended up getting our wings out of the large group, group that started. The bigger message there was you follow orders and, and you're part of something much bigger than yourself. And that's going to require sacrifice. Uh, we knew that you know this, this was pretty serious business. It is here they prove they had what it takes. Motivation, willpower, stamina, and the sincere desire to fly. Flight training uh, was a very, as you would expect in the Navy, uh, it, was a ch it was challenging. I'll never forget my first day of, of flight training. The, the commanding officer of, uh, of Naval Air Training came in and talked to us. He was a, a senior captain. He said, First of all, you're not here to be trained to fly for United Airlines. You're here to be trained to fight wars. And then he said something that really got my attention. He said, I want you to look to your left, look to your right. He said, a couple years from now, one of you won't be here. He said, you'll either wash out or you'll make a stupid decision and you'll die in an aircraft accident. But unfortunately, there was a number of those that didn't make it. I lost uh, two friends in, in training and, um, and then a couple washed out. It caused me to redouble my efforts to really work hard and be focused, not make any mistakes, be prepared for every flight as much as I could, it, it, it do well academically, and it paid off for me. This is an exciting day. Uh, this is when I actually soloed for the first time in a Navy airplane. At that moment, I thought, this is, this is really happening. I, I could hardly believe it. that. I, I actually thought I, I, I had a good chance of getting through this and becoming a, a naval aviator. Somehow, some way, I was going to fly an aircraft that allowed me to fly on the carrier, because that's, after all, why I went in the Navy. And for me, it was all about being in the tactical end of naval aviation. My first carrier experience was an eye-opener. 
And I remember the morning I woke up to do that, I thought, boy, this is it. This is what I've been looking forward to for a long, long time. So I, I recall we're flying out to the ship in, in somewhat of a loose formation. And one of the instructor pilots who were flying said, I see the ship at like 12 o'clock. And I'm looking and looking and I didn't really see anything. And then all of a sudden I spotted this little image on the horizon uh, in, out in the middle of the ocean. And my first thought was, that is really small. <laughs> That is, this is a lot smaller than I thought. When I flew over the ship and I looked over the left side of it and looked down at that, uh, that was a moment of terror and panic. Uh, I thought, this is harder, going to be harder than I thought. No power. So the first pass, I was a little rough. I was overcorrecting and I was anxious about doing everything right and thinking about this and going through the checklist. Uh, but the one thing that I missed was locking my harness. So we landed and I engaged a wire, it was successful and I came at full stop, but as soon as I engaged that wire, I, it instantly threw me forward. Yeah, because my harness was obviously not, not stopping me as it should. So I, I kind of had a, an, an interesting encounter with, with the, the um, the instrument dash on the aircraft and uh, the guys on the flight deck uh, saw that and laughed and thought that was pretty funny and and all the landings I had after that and I had well over a hundred every time I got to that point in the checklist I just kind of laughed at myself about that and it never happened again. <laughs> about the time I was finishing flight training um, I was looking at the options, and, and the option was to fly what was called an E2C, but you had to be at the top of your class to get there. And they only took the top couple of people. So that motivated me to try really hard and finish strong and work really hard at that. And and uh, did all right, and then got what I wanted, and they stationed me in San Diego flying uh, E2C Hawkeyes. Communication with defensive systems and timely coordination with combat information centers on land or sea. That's the role of the E-2C Hawkeye. This was the E-2C Hawkeye. Um, uh, it was a fun airplane to fly. It's a unique looking airplane, uh, particularly uh, distinguished by what this, this dome, what we call the radar dome. And that's really what gave us the electronic capability to see over the horizon and identify early and potential threats, threats both to the, uh, the strike group, the aircraft strike group, as well as the carrier task force. So there's two aircraft in front of this, and I was the fourth airplane. I, I was fl actually flying this one right here. We deployed in May of 1979. We thought it'd be a pretty much routine six-month deployment, and the, the first maybe month or so of that was. But at that point, uh, thing, some really unfortunate, ugly things were happening in Southeast Asia. It wasn't just but a couple of years after South Vietnam fell and a lot of Vietnamese were trying to flee. To them, the only way they could get out was to get on a, a little raft or a dinghy or some type of makeshift uh, boat. Our mission became one of uh, search and rescue for these thousands of uh, Vietnamese and Cambodians that were trying to flee a very oppressive and violent government. So our, our role uh, was we'd go out and look for these people. We knew they were out there, but in the vast ocean, they're hard to find. It was extremely rewarding to be a part of something and the U.S. government felt it, it with the capabilities that the U.S. Navy had, it was our responsibility to help these people. And, and that gave me a tremendous sense of pride to be a part of that. And it made me realize, as, as a citizen of the United States, well, we got life pretty good. That was a, a maturing event for me. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. Americans inside have been taken prisoner. It was in uh, early November, late October of 1979, and there was a revolution underway in Iran led by the Ayatollah Khomeini. 
And there was so much of a backlash against how the Shah ruled the country um, that really um, fueled this, this sense of anger towards the United States. They um, seized our embassy. Uh, they basically overran it, the Marines and, and uh, the embassy staff. This night in Washington, officials will continue their search for some way to negotiate the hostages' freedom. That search was not successful today. And our mission immediately changed. Uh, we went from what was a routine deployment, a search and rescue operation, to now we're getting ready to go to war. I had a lot of confidence in Mike. I know, I knew how careful he was, and I knew he was going to do what he needed to do to get back to us. So I wasn't worried about that as much as just the unknown of where he was going. When Walter Cronkite said that uh, President Carter was sending the Kitty Hawk to Iran, that uh, changed everything. I remember the captain, he said, as you all know, the, our embassy has, has fallen and they've taken our embassy staff as hostages and they're threatening to execute all of them and we're gonna go rescue them. He said, this will be a dangerous mission, it'll be complicated. He said, the reality is some of our young pilots aren't coming home with us. We were training hard. We were flying what they call 24-7 ops. We just fl flew night and day uh, around the clock. We would uh, prepare for uh, one possible scenario, and then, then that began to change, and we'd have to do things differently. Uh, so that added some stress. We were typically fatigued. Uh, I remember being very tired many times launching in the middle of the night. Uh, but you just get through it and you work through it. And, but I, I think maybe as a, as a result of that, uh, we had another accident uh, or two where we lost some pilots and air crew and some very experienced pilots. Um, I, mean, I think of one situation in particular, I, I knew the pilot. Um, I knew the pilot. Dear Dad, sorry I haven't written lately, but I've been pretty busy. Hope you're doing okay. We're all fine here. It says, oh, by the way, we saw the Kitty Hawk on TV. Some story on the refugees. Love you lots, Dad. Right back soon. P.S. Please don't work so hard. P.P.S. Have a really great day. This letter was about a month, maybe a month and a half, before we heard the news that his plane had gone down. As most kids, you know, he was the world to me. I mean, he was just like the picture of integrity, character, and um, it just never occurred to me that my dad would be involved in anything, um, you know, where there would be any type of conflict. It always just seemed like they were training. They were just going out and practicing and he loved flying. And so I knew it was something that he really enjoyed, but it just never really occurred to me that it was dangerous. I was 14 at the time and I heard kind of like tires on the gravel. So something was coming up the driveway. I think I popped out to see who had pulled up to our driveway. And I saw two men. One uh, was a priest. And uh, they came to the door. They rang the doorbell. And I, my mom ushered me to the other room. And um, I just remember hearing my mom crying. And, you know, I asked what happened. And they said, there's been an accident. And we don't know anything yet. His name is Commander Roderick. Very experienced pilot, lots of flight time on and off the ship, a lot of aircraft or uh, carrier landings. And he was flying at 500 feet, uh, about 250 knots, roughly. And he just disappeared. 
and nobody knows what happened to him. Um, and because it was, it was dark and bad weather, uh, the rescue attempt, uh, it was hard to even find him. And the next day, we, we, just, we found the wreckage. You're just hoping, praying, right, that it's all a bad dream. But because they never recovered the aircraft or any of the bodies, in the back of your brain, you're always hoping, right? Well, maybe he's not really dead. Maybe he was captured. Maybe, you know, a boat picked him up and he's captured. He's being, you know, another held hostage. And so it was very um, unsettling and very difficult to find peace. War can certainly change a person. From strangers to close friends, Mike Shears saw more loss than he bargained for in his six and a half years in the service. But his time as a naval aviator also helped him appreciate the time he's been given in a whole new light. This is his war story. I was watching TV, as I often do, um, at the end of the day, and uh, there was this episode on the news called War Stories. And a lot of things just started clicking as I was listening to it. Uh, this guy was an aviator. Then he just started mentioning some things and I was like, oh, well that's interesting. And so a lot of things just started to click through the story. President Carter dispatched us to the Persian Gulf to rescue our hostages. And then he just started talking about the time frame, and I was like, oh, not only was he an aviator, not only was he on the Kitty Hawk, but he was actually there at exactly the same time as my dad. And I was like, is it possible that he actually knew my dad or knew of my dad? Not only did I get to watch that and, and you know see that there's maybe a connection there, but we're gonna have a chance to actually go down. I'm gonna meet Mike and I get to ask him what his memories of my dad were, what it was like for him to be there at that time. But I haven't talked to some, somebody that knew my dad in, in many years, um, and certainly not in this context, somebody that was outside of our kind of immediate squadron family um, that actually served with him. But it's always interesting to hear how somebody that knew them in real life, you know, how, what was their interaction with them. Hi, Terry. Yeah. I'm Mike. Mike. I feel like I need to give you a hug. I'm a hugger, too. Yeah. So good to yeah. meet you. It is a pleasure to meet you. Well, I can't yeah. even tell you how surprised I was sitting on my sofa watching your story. I and I was like, wait a second. This, is sounding... this is, sounds really familiar. Could it be? And then I heard the rest of it, and I was like, wow. You know, this is interesting because for a long time, I, I, I felt like I never got full closure on that deployment. Yeah. So, an interesting story about your dad. Yeah. Um, I, I got to know him maybe more so than most in other squadrons. Oh, good. Because I was the landing signal officer. I rem and ef after every recovery, we'd have to go around to the ready rooms and debrief all the pilots on their, on their approach and their landing, how they did, and they, everybody got a grade. As a young lieutenant, I'd have to go around to all the ready rooms and debrief mostly pilots that were older than me and more experienced than me, but that's what I was trained to do. And I was always immensely intimidated by the commanding officers and the executive officers. And some of them were, would, were dismissive. In fact, most of them were, you know, you punky little lieutenant, get out of here. You know, right. you know? But your dad was different. He was different. Uh, he, he always was gracious and treated me with the respect the few times that I got to do this, and he always said, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. And I thought, man, wow, that's how I want to be <laughs> if, I ever, if I ever get to that, that point. Your dad was highly respected, not only as a pilot, but just as a human being and a great, and a great officer and leader. Oftentimes as children, we think of our, our dads as superheroes, right? Yeah. Um, but to hear a story like that really just reinforces, you know, what an amazing man he was and um, the legacy he left behind.
these were the actual dates. Um, uh, we left on 30, 30th of May and we came back on February 25th mm -hmm. the next year. Did you, I, I don't have my glasses on. Do you have a mustache there? Uh, not there, no? I didn't. No, no, I couldn't grow one now. I was trying to say that. Uh, yeah. And there's oh, there your dad. You go. And, yeah, and my dad had one yeah. too. Yeah. 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 That was the look. I yeah. couldn't have done that to save my life right? <laughs> back, back then. Um, but as I said, um, all the memories of, that any of us that knew, got to know your dad were just the type that made us better people. You know, I've got a couple pictures of him in my house, and I think about him, you know, daily. Yeah, yeah I can see why. Yeah. It's so good Bye, to meet you. Goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. This won't be the last time we're going to see each other. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It was great to hear somebody else speak about, you know, one of your parents in such a positive way and how impactful it was. Um, so it, it, it meant a lot, and it's going to be with me for a long time. The way this all comes kind of full circle now, as I mentioned to Terry, has given me an element of closure that I feel like I've been missing all these years and maybe didn't even know it. Being able to meet the daughter of somebody that many years ago I got close to in a very different way in a, in a professional relationship and had immense respect for and could never understand the loss of that person. But today I began to gain some clarity on that. And that's a real blessing. He probably left a 22-year-old kid and came back a 23-year-old, 24-year-old man who'd probably seen a lot of things that most of us can't even fathom. The stories that he shared with me were often through tears, but um, through the years and just maturing myself, I can see where seeing things that people shouldn't have to see changes them a lot. The strongest feeling I had is why, why them? Why not me? How was I not? How was I lucky enough not to be in that aircraft? The, the sense of permanent loss, first time I ever experienced something like that in life, it made me realize life is fragile, and and you never know when your last day is going to be. So that ex that uh, whole experience in the Persian Gulf was interesting. We sat out there for several months, and then we never got to do it. And that was, a, that was a hard day. We all wanted to go home, but more than that, we wanted to do this. We wanted to get this over with. We wanted to go save our fellow Americans. We were told we'd be relieved by another carrier task force. Uh, it was the Nimitz, the Nimitz task force. And we were going home. And, and that bothered me a lot. I, I thought, you know, while we've been on station here, we lost six air crew pilots and naval flight officers getting ready for this and now, we, now we're not going to get to do it? It just felt wrong. We found out later that they did try to rescue the hostages and it was a disaster. It was a terrible failure and an embarrassing day for America. And they landed at Desert One and then a sandstorm kicked up and then the aircraft and the helicopters tried to take off and and they, they, they collided with one another, and, and we lost all of those people. But I do believe, had we gone in and, and executed the mission as it was designed at that point, we trained for, we could have got them out uh, in early November. When I was in the military, I thought there was nothing unique or special about that, but at this point in my life, looking back over many years, what I've done in the corporate world and what I did in the military, uh, I feel that what I did in the Navy were probably the most significant years of my life. Um, not only did it shape me who I am as a person in many ways, uh, and probably, well, not probably, without doubt, equipped me with the skills 
that I probably that I needed to succeed. Uh, without the Navy experience, I don't. I'm convinced I would not have been able to achieve the things I have in life. It really did change the course of, of, of my life and the direction of my life.